We are delighted to be joined by Costi Hin. Costi, welcome to Exposit the Word. Great to be here with you guys. Thanks for having me on and working with the time change as well. Oh, it's a pleasure. Costi Hin, your surname sounds very familiar. Yeah, I'm... Uh... <laughs> my last name is Hin. I'm related to Benny Hin, but we would have different theology. <laughs> That's right, you have. So, so let's start off, Costi. What is the prosperity gospel, and why is it so bad? Yeah, the prosperity gospel is the idea that believing in Jesus is going to make me healthy, wealthy, and happy. Uh, it it is derived from a very twisted view of the Christian gospel in a couple of facets. First, the idea of confession. So, if you've ever heard of, you know, name it and claim it or uh, some people say blab it and grab it. You know, this idea that I'm going to confess something and get something back from God is based on the same way we would confess our need for Christ and we would confess Christ as Lord and be saved, or we would confess our sins, like 1 John 1, 9 says, and be forgiven and cleansed of all unrighteousness. Well, prosperity gospel preachers say, hey, you can confess a lot of things, not just your salvation or forgiveness of sins from God, but you can confess a Bentley, a mansion, a promotion, yeah. a baby, or whatever you want, and God will do it. And then the prosperity gospel also would take the idea of the abundant life from John 10, yeah. where Jesus says the thief, or really the devil, comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come that they may have life and might have it more abundantly. Mm -hmm. The prosperity gospel says the abundant life is riches and glory and blessings now, yeah. whereas the true gospel is about eternity because of repentance and faith in Christ, whether you're rich or poor at all. So what's the kind of language used by these prosperity preachers from the pulpit then, Costi? You're going to hear a lot of words like breakthrough, abundance, prosper, all of it tied to God and you. Uh, a lot of them will take certain promises or, or even instances from the Old Testament where God is making a promise to Abraham or someone else. And I'm not talking about, you know, universal covenants for all believers where, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the promises of Abraham and the seed of Abraham. I'm not talking about that, but you know what I mean when he's, you know, he's saying, hey, They'll take a passage about land or about blessings or riches and say, hey, that's for me. You know, I'm going to have land and I'm going to be blessed and God has plans for me. And it's this idea that anywhere in the Bible that talks about blessings or physical material provision is a promise for wealth for the believer. And that's just simply not true. Yeah, sure. Take us back to the beginning, because you were actually involved with Benny Hinn's ministry, right? So what age was you when you got involved, and what did you actually do there? Yeah, I was about 19 years old, and I was a catcher, and I worked with my uncle. We traveled the world on his Gulfstream jet, and we went to the best hotels in the world. I remember one time, uh, actually frequently, but very often, and one time in particular, uh, spending time on a European tour and we went to London, we went to Paris, we made our way over to Dubai as well and we used to always stay at the Lanesboro in London and we would shop at Harrods and have a great time and spend lots of money and, and live really like rock stars but all of it was on donations and we thought that because we were uh, supposedly anointed leaders and uh, healers and God's representatives as you know as prophets or apostles, if you will, that we were entitled to a life of lavish living, that God wants us all to be wealthy, and we were an example to people of how God wanted us to prosper. And so traveled the world, best hotels in the world, spent tens of thousands of dollars on any given trip, really hundreds of thousands if you add up the totals, and all of it uh, was supposed to be an example of how we were living the abundant life. What was it like backstage once the cameras were off, Costi? Was there an effort to keep up the illusion that the ministry was actually serving the Lord? Or, or you know, was it a case of when the money was being counted, that, you know, it was almost like, uh, you know, bank robbers after they robbed the bank, you know, counting the money and laughing about it. What, what was kind of a culture backstage? Yeah, I think it was a mixture of both. There would be times where, um, you know, we would I would see things that were very dishonest or very uh, like a show, and we would... Uh, you know, you'd hear certain people talking about editing the program properly or getting the right people on the stage yeah. because the whole goal 
is to make sure that the people who get on the platform actually look healed. Yeah. You can't have people up there just to get prayed for. Mm -hmm. And so they censor everything in the lines and they only bring people up who have a great story. They look excited. And of course you can't verify anything, but it's supposed to look like a real thing. And so sometimes I would hear conversations or be involved in conversations where, uh, you know, we would be telling the editors that they need to do a better job making things look good. So there's that. And we would see that things, I, I could see that there were some things that were shady. Yeah. And then on the flip side, there were other times behind the scenes where I would see my uncle cry or my dad or a family member. And, and really they would be thanking God for all that he did. And they would be saying, this is so amazing. Look at all that God did. And it was like, they really believed. And, and I know I did mm. that God was, in the work we were doing. Meanwhile, now I look back and I realize that a lot of that, we were just self-deceived, but yeah. it was a mixture of both. Yeah, okay. How aware of the criticism was you when you were involved in the ministry? I was really aware because we would have news organizations come to our house yeah. in our church mm -hmm. and they would want to interview my dad or interview people from our church and they would say things. And then when those programs were aired on television, we would see them on national networks and we would watch them. And the way that we would define those type of efforts was to say, oh, that's just the devil attacking us through the media. The media is anti-God. They're against us. This is just the devil trying to come against our ministry. And it was a sign of persecution or suffering. And so we would then say, we're just like Paul. We're just like Jesus being opposed for the gospel. What an honor and a privilege it is to be opposed for the gospel. There are many names that come to mind when you think of prosperity preachers. Um, how much contact did you have with these other well-known uh, preachers, Costi? A fair amount. We would cross paths with Morris Cirillo and we would go on TBN with Paul and Jan Crouch and many others. And uh, overall, that was the circle that we ran in. A lot of times, the bigger name prosperity preachers are very focused on their own ministry, building their own revenue stream. And so they don't often appear together or share stages all the time, but at special conferences and whatnot, we would. But I remember one time uh, being in Hawaii and getting to visit with uh, Jesse Duplantis, and we sat in one of his services and um, you know, Joyce Meyer and all the like, it's, it's the, that's the circle of friends that mm. a lot of times we're in. So then what happened? What, what happened for you to realize that you were on the wrong path? Well, for me, it was a journey. I sort of questioned things when I was younger, but over time, what began to happen is what I call cracks in the dam, Yeah, cracks in the dam, different moments where, I had questions and they couldn't be answered or I begin to read things in the Bible. And I know this sounds so simple and I don't mean to oversimplify it, but it really is the power of God's word. I would read things in the Bible and it was flat out different than what we were teaching. Mm -hmm. And slowly but surely that began to erode my way of thinking. And God used people in my life. I always say this to Christians that uh, we are plan A. We are plan A. We're God's plan A. There's no plan B. He has called us to be the ministers of salvation, if you will. And I, I love what John Calvin said that God is the author of salvation, but men are the ministers of it. In other words, God authors, he saves, he's in it for sure. But who does he use to distribute the message? People, men, women, all over the world, the church. And so there were people who were willing to speak into my life and to tell me the truth. And they were ministers of the message of salvation. And so uh, one of those people was a coach that I had in college. I played baseball at an American university in Dallas, Texas. And he used to talk to me about the sovereignty of God, yeah. which was crazy in my mind because I used to think that I was sovereign and that I was the puppet master, if you will, and God was the puppet. And I could control him with my faith, with an offering, with speaking the right words. And I began to realize that like Psalm 115 verse three says, our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. God is sovereign. And that was a truth that really messed me up. And then uh, slowly but surely, then God used my wife, who's now my wife, a girl who came into my life at the time, and she couldn't speak in tongues. And my family used to say, she's not saved. 
unless she speaks in tongues. And so uh, we begin to study the Bible. And I remember coming across 1 Corinthians 12, 30, where Paul says, not all, do they? Not all have gifts of tongues, interpretation, healing, etc. And we begin to see there were certain things my family was teaching that I believed that were completely opposite of what the Bible taught. And so there was that. And then finally, it was an amazing pastor, a mentor of mine, who was in my life, and I was pastoring, if you could believe it, at a church that was a little bit, we were a little bit, uh, I call it mushy. We were we were not prosperity gospel, but we certainly weren't a, a church that was into expository preaching until one day the pastor said, I want to try this out where we go verse by verse through a book of the Bible. And we all looked at each other like, what is that? And so... Um, <laughs> We used to preach a lot of topical sermons about whatever, you know, whatever flavor of the week, and we would just tell stories. And so we thought, okay, so my turn was some months later to preach, and it was the, the passage I was supposed to preach was John chapter 5, verses 1 through 17, the healing at the pool of Bethesda. And even back then, we used to take massive swaths of scripture, and 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 so it was not really verse by verse. It was maybe biblical storytelling, at least. Yeah, but, yeah. but at that point, we were <laughs> breaking down some of the verses. Yeah. Um, now, at our church, you know, we're we're preaching one to two verses on a Sunday sometimes, just yeah. because there's so many rich truths to preach through. But yeah. for to make a longer story shorter, I'm preaching on healing, the healing at the pool of Bethesda. I figure that I've got healing nailed because I'm a hen. Like I, I know this topic, and brother, I begin to see. Jesus heals one man out of a multitude, which totally wrecked my world because I always thought God has willed that all would be healed, and he always heals everybody, and now here Jesus heals one. I thought, that's weird. And then we get to Jesus healing him immediately. John records. There's no fanfare. There's no white jacket. There's no music. There's no stadium. Nothing. Just Jesus healing in power immediately, the Bible says. And then... The man doesn't even know who Jesus was when the Pharisees questioned him. And so that really messed me up because I thought, well, how in the world did he have enough faith to get his healing if he didn't even know who Jesus was? You have to have faith to get healed. But if you don't know who Jesus is, you you can't have faith in somebody you don't know. And I looked at a commentary that my pastor had given me just before the study. And he said, this might help. And it was a, a commentary by John MacArthur. And I didn't really know at the time that John MacArthur was an expositor or that even he had said some things that were uh, contrary to what my family taught. I just thought, here's this burgundy commentary. I might as well try it out. (laughs) So I did. And as I read, he said in the commentary, here is an example of Jesus's sovereign power in healing. This is an example of his sovereignty. He heals this man not because of any merits of his own, but simply because he chose to. He's sovereign. And it blew my mind because I suddenly remembered my baseball coach that used to tell me about sovereignty. I started to remember all the times that I'd studied things in the Bible that were against what my family taught and that I believed. And then MacArthur goes off in another section and says, this is the cruelest lie of faith healers today, that the people they fail to heal— are guilty of negative confession, unbelief, on and on. And I thought, oh my goodness, that is me. That's what I believe. That's what I taught. And in that moment, uh, the scales really fell from my eyes. I realized that I was a sinner. I realized I had had false beliefs, that I was an accompaniment to false teaching, that I had benefited from it, and I wanted nothing to do with it. So I turned to Christ. Really, he, he turned my heart and changed my mind. And I responded in faith by his grace. And before I knew it, um, I was in seminary. I was in training. I stepped back a little bit from formal pastoral ministry. And that was now seven, almost eight years ago. And I am so thankful for the Lord's grace. And it was all through the power of God's word and the faithfulness of other people preaching to me. I think it was the summer that your book came out, God, Greed and the Prosperity Gospel, right? Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Yep. So during that time, um, 
your your uncle Benny, he, he sort of backtracked a little bit, didn't he, and said that he was stepping away from the prosperity gospel. Um, I know a lot of people online at that time were very cynical because he'd made those sort of uh, noises before. Um, what's happened since, uh, Costi? Have you had a conversation with him? Have we seen any? Have, have we seen a um, a true confession of, of of moving away from that kind of lifestyle? No, unfortunately. Well, let me start with this. Fortunately, he made that statement, and I was very thankful that he said something at least that was against the 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 antics that he used to hold to, mm. which was putting dollar amounts to healing. So, give a thousand dollars for your miracle. Give ten thousand for your miracle. All mm. of that. So, I'm mm. thankful that he he renounced that, but he unfortunately didn't renounce the false faith healing. He didn't renounce uh, prosperity preaching or the prosperity gospel in general. He actually came out later and said, you know, I'm all for prosperity, just some of the amounts and some of the excesses. And what I would say is this, there is a massive difference biblically between remorse and repentance, right? Mm -hmm. Remorse is I'm sorry because I've gotten caught. I'm sorry because this is not a good thing. I'm sorry because people are noticing. I'm sorry because I don't want to lose money or get in trouble. Yeah. Repentance is I change my mind. Repentance is Zacchaeus saying, I don't care anymore. I want to follow Jesus. I'm going to pay people back. If I have no money, uh, you know, whatever, it's just all in on Jesus. Mm. And that is probably the most important reality when it comes to repentance versus remorse. Repentance is a total change of mind and a change of heart. Remorse is just feeling sorry because you basically got caught. And that, I think, is where my uncle still is based on the information that I have. But I'm prayerful and hopeful that the Lord would move in his heart and that soon, eventually, we would see, see lasting and genuine repentance. How is worship music used to draw people into a prosperity gospel, Costi? It's a huge aspect of the prosperity gospel because music is something that people love and they enjoy today. And to be honest, it's very easy to draw people in with music because music is so universal. Mm -hmm. Uh, Somebody might hear a preacher and have opinions right away and say, oh, I don't like this preacher or I don't like his teaching or that's unbiblical. But music can be a gateway because you could have a band that sings amazing songs, they sound really good, and everybody feels good about it, and you don't really know that they're actually false teachers Mm -hmm. or that they're linked to false teachers. Mm -hmm. And I've even heard different teachers that preach uh, dangerous doctrines say the music we produce and the bands that we promote are gateways to our teaching. They, they're trying to draw people in through the music because once you have people and their heart and their interest, whatever you teach them, they're like sheep and they can easily be led astray. Yeah. And so music is definitely a, a huge part of drawing people into false teaching. And that is the goal. And it was actually Bill Johnson who said that the music is the gateway to their to their teaching. And you're absolutely right. They're, we are one – you're one click away from – entering into a world that teaches that Jesus was just a man Mm -hmm. in right relationship to God, that he laid aside his divinity. Those are things that are, are bona fide heresies. And Bill Johnson will teach those. And both of those, he says in multiple books, uh, one book in particular is called when heaven invades earth and he preaches it in different sermons. And the idea is Jesus was just a man in right relationship with God who was doing signs and wonders. So guess what? You can do them too. And then they'll say, just pay pay tuition and come to our school, yeah. and we'll teach you how. Yeah. And the way that they exploit young people is through the arts. And unfortunately, a lot of that is linked to music. Yeah. And often, it isn't actually that the, the lyrics, uh, you know, they, there's no, they're not heretical. It's actually the fact that sometimes they, they'll pass a Christian smell test. It's, it's the fact that they are a gateway and also... You know, churches are actually supporting these ministries as well because through the CCLI licensing agreement, they're actually going to be making a lot of money through churches singing their songs as well, right? Yeah, they are able to make a massive amount of money through that. And so let's say you have a song that has great theology in it and it sounds great and people love it. Well, if you are singing a song that is written and produced by Bethel, um, 
you are directly supporting their ministry by purchasing the music. They are going to get royalties from that, and it funds their heresy. And you and I both know that Mm -hmm. the enemy, the devil, does not show up at the foot of people's beds with a pitchfork, you know, saying, here I am to deceive you. You know, I'm a false teacher. I'm going to come after you. He's subtle. He uses those to appear to be workers of righteousness, Paul tells the church at Corinth. And it's the same way today. Mm -hmm. These groups and movements have many things that they teach that are truthful, but it only takes a drop of poison to poison a whole barrel of water. And that's what they do. They are teaching one, two, or three very core fundamental heresies covered up by many different truths. And they would affirm with their doctrinal statements and they'll affirm even on certain interviews, oh, we believe this, or oh yeah, we believe the Bible. But what they teach and do is different. And so very important that churches can discern rightfully the word and also know what is essential and what is non-essential. And then when it comes to Christology or the teaching about Christ, mm. and when it comes to the gospel, those are essential. We yeah. can never get those wrong. We were called in this interview at the end of March and we're in the middle of, uh, you know, the, the corona virus outbreak. Um, what's the biblical way to, to view this coronavirus right now, Costi? Well, uh, I'm sure a lot of guys are talking about this particular passage, and I don't mind bringing it up again because just like uh, the New Testament, often Peter, Paul, they'll, they'll say, it's no bother, if you will, <laughs> for me to remind you of these things. There's a yeah. lot of repetition in the New Testament because we need to hear truth over and over. Yeah. I think the right approach is uh, Philippians 4, 4 through 9. Uh, especially verse 6 and 7, where we're to be anxious for nothing, and we're to trust the Lord, to be praying about everything, to be thankful. We're to set our mind on things that are above. I think that we should rejoice, as verse 4 says in Philippians 4, rejoice always, and our rejoicing should be in the Lord. And so in the midst of a pandemic like this, our hope as Christians is anchored in Christ. Like Peter teaches in First and Second Peter, we are sojourners. We're just passing through this world. Heaven is our home. And so that's the goal all along is to keep our eyes on Christ and focus on him in times like these, because the world will quickly shift our focus onto uh, illness, sickness, pandemic, worry, doubts, fears, hoarding, survival. And look, it's fine to prepare. Yeah. But we want to trust God above all else, knowing that in the end, he's our source. And then lastly, though this might seem morbid to the human mind, if people die, which many are already, but if we die, guess what? Our attorney, our, our eternity is secure. Our eternal home is secure in Christ. And our snippet of life here on earth pales in comparison to the glory of heaven. And so we do, as believers, have a greater hope than what is happening on this world. And then finally, I'll say this. In the meantime, we are, again, here to accomplish the mission of God, if you will. It, we're not going to evangelize in heaven. When we go to heaven, it's over. Yeah. While we're here, the call is to spread the gospel. Yeah. The call is to proclaim the good news to the world. And so in the middle of a pandemic is, yes, a good time to be a model citizen. It's a good time to love others. But in the midst of all of that, we must ensure that we are proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. So good. There are many churches right now, Costi, over the last few weeks, scrambling to sign up to Zoom um, and find ways of being able to embrace technology in this season. You're at Redeemer now. You guys are putting some great content out via your YouTube channel. Tell me about how your church has embraced that and what the opportunities are in this season, Costi. Yeah, we're very thrilled and excited, although it can be out of our comfort zone, to embrace technology. And so our team, we have right now, we have four staff pastors, John Benzinger, Dale Thakra, Kyle Swanson, and myself. And we've just worked as a team. And to be honest, those guys are incredibly talented. And we've got a media director who's uh, a lot younger. I think he's a little younger than all of us. He knows a few more things than we do. (laughs) And we have just decided that we are going to leverage media however we can and do our best to put out content. And so we have a YouTube channel like many churches, we've been using it. And so we put out uh, the Daily Word, which is a daily devotional, real simple. We've been recording it on our cell phones. So this isn't like expensive. We record it on our cell phones. 
and we follow an annual reading plan. And we're just going through right now the Gospel of Mark. We just finished it. And it's five minutes every day, a little devotional by a pastor. And then we're also preaching as many sermons as we can. I just preached two in our worship center. And those will get posted this weekend or next week. John is preaching on the live stream every Sunday. And then also we have our Redeeming Truth video podcast. And so the, the key is this. you got to have a deep well. And that's why we want to read a lot, pray a lot. We want to spend time with the Lord. Because this is a season to pour out yeah. what's inside. Yeah. So. I would encourage pastors and churches to begin drawing the deep well water out. So go back to those old manuscripts that you put in a drawer and you thought you'd never use. Uh, go back to those old blog ideas and vlog ideas. Go back to those uh, old notes from sitting with wise mentors about leadership and how to do ministry and pull them all out and start using those as resources to teach others. And we've just tried our best to embrace that and use all the social media platforms to get the message of the gospel out and to equip the church. That's so cool. And where can the listeners find your YouTube channel? If you were to just go to YouTube and type in Redeemer Bible Church, you'll see us. There's a, there's a few Redeemer Bible Churches. So I recommend if you want to put Redeemer Bible Church, uh, Kosti Hinn or Redeemer Bible Church, John Benzinger or Redeemer Bible Church, Gilbert, Arizona. Use our names or our city, and it'll come up. There's about 13 or so, or 12 or 13,000 subscribers now, and so plenty of people on there engaging the content. And then I'm on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and our other pastors are as well, and so just look for me on there. I'm Costi W. Hinn, and I'd love to uh, in, encourage you and, and, and dialogue with people online. What I'll do, Costa, is I'll put the links, I'll find all the links, and I'll put them in the description below in this video so that um, the listeners can can find out really easily. Costi, thank you so much for your time. I know you're an incredibly busy person, and I, I really am grateful for your, your ministry and for your time today. I appreciate you having me on. Thank you so much. Thank you, Costi.